Hello and welcome to this radical exchange panel about radical agreement. How can we do a better job finding common ground in politics? Um, my name is Leon. I'm the moderator for this discussion and work as an entrepreneurship and technology evangelist at Radical Exchange Foundation. I'm joined here by uh, three remarkable panelists, uh, Jen Moran, uh, Mark Reif and Paula Berman. Um, for those of you who don't know Radical Exchange, it's a social movement for next generation political economies. And today we will talk about the next generation of democracy and politics as uh, political ideological conflict is on the rise all around the globe. The media landscape, especially social networks on the internet is, is really disorienting. And as a consequence, political debate uh, seems to lack the source of truth or factfulness, as well as uh, moral common ground. Um, so how can we do a better job finding common ground in politics? Uh, to, to answer the question, we invited these three panelists uh, who have diverse but intersectional perspectives. Uh, Paula Berman is a hacktivist at the intersection of democracy and technology. She works with uh, Democracy Earth, Earth Foundation, which is a nonprofit dedicated to building censorship resistant uh, borderless democracies on the internet. And moreover, she's a leading researcher of decentralized identity protocols and intersection identity in general. Mark Reif is a moral, legal and political philosopher uh, currently at UC Davis. Um, he's a writer of five books. Um, he just uh, published uh, the volume In the Name of Liberty, the Argument for Universal Unionization. Uh, currently, he's working on a new book project, which really relates to this panel called The Unbearable Resilience of Illiberalism. Uh, most of you will know Jennifer Marone, who is the CEO of Radical Exchange Foundation and a multidisciplinary visual artist, activist and filmmaker. In 2014, she incorporated herself to a protest against the exploitation of human beings and the data economy. And recently she directed the Scheme of Things, which is a collaborative uh, multimedia project that engages people in collective storytelling about alternative worlds that they want to live in. Um, just to go over some logistics, uh, we will dive into a like generative conversation between the panelists for about 60 minutes. And afterwards, we'll have 30 minutes left for questions from the audience. So in total, we'll be in this uh, one and a half hours. Uh, if you'd like to post some questions for the panelists, um, you can do that at radicalexchange.org slash TV, uh, where we have a widget integrated from Slido or you could go to Slido directly, uh, slido.com and enter the event code RxC. Um, so to kick this off, uh, I would like to quote a part of a speech uh, from the very end of the film, The Great Dictator, uh, which was published in 1940, created and starred by the brilliant uh, British comedian, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, Chaplin spent many months uh, drafting and rewriting the speech for his film right at the beginning of World War II. And I'm just highlighting that fact because among other things, the panelists will later discuss the role of arts, aesthetics and rhetoric in politics. Um, quote, we have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in man, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. And even though the speech is 80 years old, uh, the contrast between the spread of machinery and information technologies on one hand and ideological conflict on the other seems to meet the present political zeitgeist better than ever. Um, so Mark, uh, why is illiberalism or in other words, the antidote of human dignity so resilient and, and why is it so popular in particular today? And perhaps uh, do we need a Chaplin style appeal for the 21st century? 
But I, that, that's a great speech, Leanne. I love that speech. And yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing I need, uh, the th kinds of things we need, I think, to, um, to, to bring people's attention around to what's happening. I, I, I think what's, what current circumstances have revealed is that illiberal impulses are endemic in human nature. And perhaps because you know we already had a great war about this and thought liberalism had triumphed and then this feeling was reinforced by the fall of the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe, I, I think we came to believe that, that we're all liberals now and that while we could have arguments between the left and the right in liberalism, liberalism is uh, it covers a great, a great many range of views. Uh, we thought we were still all making arguments within liberalism. And I think that's, and as a result of that, unfortunately false belief, we've stopped really defending and advocating for liberal values. Um, we think, for example, that it's enough to call someone a racist and, and criticize them as a racist and show that they are a racist. And that is a criticism if you embrace liberal values, but of course it's not a criticism if you're a racist, it's a compliment. Um, and we seem to think that racism is self-evidently wrong. And I'm just using racism as, a, as an example here. And it is self-evidently wrong to people who embrace liberal values, but people who reject liberal values and, and use a completely different set of values to evaluate society. It's not self-evidently wrong. These things need to be argued for. We can't just we can't just display illiberal beliefs and actions and not continue to make the argument about why these things are wrong. And I'm afraid today we tend not to do that. We tend just to display and illustrate things as being illiberal instead of arguing for what's wrong with that. We've 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 lost that view. And, and that's a real, real problem. Um, and I think it's allowed the illiberal impulses which seem in, uh, embedded in human nature and we don't seem to be able to eliminate, it's allowed them to sort of grow unchecked. Um, and, and that's why we're all in the sort of scary spot I think we are, are today. Um, and so there's a, it, obviously a combination of, of, of factors in there, but um, we need to do a lot of things to cure this and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there so the other panelists can, can jump in and we can talk about what maybe we should do in, in, in a little <coughs> later. Okay, um, thank you so much for this intro, Mark. Um, yeah, Jen, do you maybe want to um, speak to uh, the role of the radical exchange movement in in like reimagining these liberal or like free values and and how we can make them explicit in a way that that is you know compelling yes so that's great that you took the charlie chaplin example that's art commenting on both commenting in a critical way in a sarcastic way satire using satire to comment on the situation that they were living through while at the end making a very sincere um, statement, a sincere effort with that, with that um, speech. And one thing that I think has happened has been that the arts and artists and philosophers and visionaries have kind of been siloed out of building the things of our world, whether it's governance or in industry, and they've been kind of pushed to the side as <clears throat> if they're brought in as illustrators or window dressers of what others mm. want. And one thing about the radical exchange community, it embraces and feels very important that artists and people in that, that kind of realm that are free from industry or free from working within an organization um, to, to be involved in many levels and to be more cross collaborative across disciplines. And that we need new stories, we need new visions, we need a way to also criti criticize 
um, constructively the things that we are thinking about building, that it's not just gung ho, move forward with this idea and to, to test them out, but to talk. And so it's a, I think the radical exchange movement, that was what drew me that embraced um, people in the arts sectors, unlike any other organizations I had come across until then. And, you know, I'm a, a kind of director position, which is quite interesting. Also, a mm -hmm. lot of people in the arts find that, um, you know, we're not joiners. We're also, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you can have a job or you can be an artist, but you can't really do both, even though everybody, most everybody has to do both. And it's, it's a little bit taboo to take on a position such as this in some ways. Um, but I think actually more leaders are needed or more artists are needed in leadership positions, just like more philosophers. Um, and that it's not always about the bottom line, but a greater vision. I see, I see. Thank you. Um, Paula, maybe as, as you're working in, in really the cutting edge information technology industry, building like very robust uh, cryptographic voting models and so forth. Um, what's like your perception of, of like narratives that allow artists and more creative people to join these communities and, and where do you see problems and, or, and what do you think is like the, a, a good way to, to onboard, onboard those kind of storytelling individuals? Well, first, thank you so much for putting this together, Leon. It's such an honor to be here and to be taking part in this important conversation. Um, thank you. I think that in terms of narrative, I think one of the, this is not directly connected to, to the role of artists, but more in general to um, how can we think about change and how, how is the narrative about change changing. One of the most significant things that um, also goes back to this point of liberalism that I have seen in the past year uh, with the pandemic is that we have really come to realize that there's no way around states. And I think this was very emblematic with uh, Fukuyama who once claimed the end of history and uh, you know, the eternity of the liberal order that seemed like it had been conquered. And right at the beginning of the pandemic, he wrote, he wrote uh, that it takes a state, uh, echoing Hillary Clinton's, it takes a village. And I think that this was really interesting coming from him, obviously, but overall, I think that this um, crisis of illiberalism can in some ways be seen as a crisis of um, leaders coming to power precisely to erode state from within. <laughs> and this, this is the kind of um, current that I think that we are up against. Maybe that's a simplistic view, but it's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the components. And then I think when it comes to narratives around technology, I'm uh, very publicly extremely inspired um, with Taiwan. I think it's mm. one of the greatest examples that we could be looking at in terms of how, how we can um, incorporate. So, so we had this you know, enormous uh, shift in our societies with the development of the internet and as with the printing press and every single information technology before it, it's bringing many shifts in society and I think that it, it is up to us to, to decide what we're going to be doing with these technologies. And Taiwan is interesting because it, as, as someone who has been working with civic technology for a few years and trying to push this forward, um, for a long time, I think that this, especially in Brazil and more like around 2000, 16, I think, because in Brazil, we had a lot of civic technology and even some of the first 
um, experiments with participatory budgeting more here. And around 2016, we had this big shift in the executive power going much more, leaning much more uh, towards the right and towards uh, populist kind of leaders. Mm -hmm. And many of the initiatives were uh, ended at that time. And I, I remember I went to this, uh, I'll finish my, my, my statement very soon, but just a, a sad memory remembering uh, this first, uh, get first open government gathering of Brazil in 2016 and in it was in Sao Paulo and we had people from all over the country coming there and sharing their practices and it was all so beautiful I think that Sao Paulo had gotten a prize they had an open government secretary in the city of Sao Paulo they had open government ambassadors all over the city running deliberation meetings like it was the dream and Sounds like Taiwan. So many, <laughs> yeah, there were so many incredible things being achieved. And then all of that, you know, and but everyone was also extremely depressed because we knew that that was going to be, um, those policies were not going to be continued. And indeed, they weren't. Um, and I think that what, what is interesting now with Taiwan and the way that Taiwan used open government practices to... Um, distribute masks, to uh, do contact tracing, all of these things, and really have one of the best performances in this pandemic in, in the world, the fewest death, deaths per capita, um, and very, very little economic impact. It helps us make a case for civic technology and for participation with economic terms, which tend to be more listened to. So that's a a, a new narrative that I think is a really important one and I think can help us um, move forward with, with implementing these, these practices that I think are super important. And I think that they also impact, you know, just speaking to, to the idea of, of artists coming to leadership, this idea that you can have, that your government is like this open canvas that you can create upon is I think one of the most exciting uh, things that you could do as an artist. And there's, a, there's room to kind of reinvigorate a sense of um, creation really and, and passion around uh, working with, with governments, hopefully in, in that path. Awesome, thank you. Um, do, you do you have any direct comments to this, Mark? Yeah, yeah, I, I think both both uh, Janet and, and Paula have said some really important things, and and so um, I want to just echo those and maybe put them in slightly different, more philosophical language to sort of frame them in, in a slightly different way. So, um, it, if we're arguing for liberal moral values, <clears throat> we can't use those values to argue with people who reject them because the issue is which values should we accept? And so we can't assume one set, the set we're arguing for in that argument. We have to somehow, um, we have to somehow use some sort of standard that everybody shares if we're gonna argue for that. And it would be nice, I suppose, if we could identify some, uh, uh, overwhelming even people who we disagree with viciously or vehemently on moral issues find the same kind of stories, paintings, artistic expressions, intriguing, interesting, engaging, etc. Not always, of course, but sometimes. So there does seem to be a shared aesthetic language um, that we can use. So by creating narratives, creating myths about the kind of society we want to be, if those are engaging and attractive enough, those can indeed be um, used as arguments. So, so I, I think Jen is, is, is emphasizing exactly the right thing here, that in, in, the, in the current debate, um, aesthetic argument and the, the forms of narrative, the forms of art, the forms of music, these are the things that we can still use to communicate with people. Um, and, and, and just to, to take up on something that Paula said, it, it reminded me of something that the uh, uh, Italian fascist philosopher 
uh, uh, Gentili said about democracy. Um, he said, fascism is the greatest expression of democracy ever. And what he meant by that is that under fascism, there is no mediating body between the leader and the people. The leader is assumed to just be an expression of the underlying zeitgeist of the people. Uh, and all the mediating bodies like the legislature or government anything are simply removed. And um, I find that that claim perverse because it, 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 I can misunderstand what democracy is all about, but you can actually see it in operation. The best example being, you know, Trump's um, constant use of, of, of tweets and Twitter to communicate with the American public. The, the relationship between Trump and at least his followers is unmediated by anything. And that really is in line with this fascist idea that that somehow is democracy. It's a, it's a perverse form of democracy, but it is. And, and, and so technology has actually made it possible for Gentile's view from the twenties to be implemented. But of course, technology can also do, do something about vetting that. So we, 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 we got the lines of communication open and what we have to sort of reinstall is the kind of vetting that we would expect in a true democracy where there is some series of levels um, as we're talking, as we're going up in government that, that things are discussed and modified and tweaked and, and, and changed and that there isn't this idea that a single person represents an entire people. It's just, it's just not possible. So again, I thought that was a really important comment too. Could I say one thing about language in itself as to, as another issue. So we, this term liberalism and liberal values has already been brought up a number of times since we started <laughs> the conversation and immediately, um, you know, say if we had a very uh, diverse demographic tuning in today, I, I hope you can hear me. My connection is a little bit unstable. Um, we can. Jump right in if I start to break up. But there's, <clears throat> so if we have this diverse group of audience, I'm sure a percentage would just stop listening because we've used this, this terminology. And mm -hmm. I, I've been thinking lately about um, how much we, you know, we have these in groups and out groups. And when somebody says conservative or labels themselves or what they're talking about is that, we don't go further into what we're actually talking about. And we treat things as a binary option, yes or no, I'm like for this or against it. And there's often so much nuance in between. And I think that putting things in these categories of liberal, conservative um, is doing a disservice at the moment. And instead, like Mark, you said, even if we talk about our values and the moral values, we probably won't agree. But if we talk about the specifics, um, like not just throwing out equality, but maybe economic equality or solidarity, like what does that mean? And, and move away from liberal values because I think there's different interpretations of what liberal has become. And is it worth redefining that or is it worth just speaking more about the issues that we're talking about and how, and how they affect people in different ways? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great point. And, and part of the problems we have in communicating now is that everybody uses the same words in different ways. Yeah. And therefore it's very difficult to tell what we're each talking about. Now, when I've been using the term liberalism, I'm not uh, simply referring to people who are on the moderate left, and that certainly is in, in, indeed a way that people use that term. I'm using the term liberalism in the children of the enlightenment sense. And under that very, very broad sense, um, conservatives are liberals. Um, traditional conservatives are liberals. Uh, Trumpists and neoconservatives are not liberals, they're anti-liberals. Um, but um, it's not true that liberalism uh, 
is simply a view of the moderate left. It's a view of the moderate right and left too, which goes, I think, to your earlier point about left and right. The left and right distinction is misleading because people can be on the left or the right and be liberals. Um, and people could be on the left or the right and illiberals, or what I usually call them as perfectionists. They have a very rigid view of how society should be organized and any deviation from that is, is, is completely unacceptable. So you're right, part of the problem here is that we're, everybody uses the same words, but they have different meanings. So um, I, I, do think, I do think the term liberal is important because it does have a technical enlightenment sense meaning that has a long historical tradition. And so I think rather than just abandoning that word for a word that's say progressive, but that would just refer to the moderate left, not the moderate right. I, I think we just sort of need to reclaim the word, the word liberal back from people and make clear what we mean when we're talking about that. So, so you, that's incredibly important. And um, you're absolutely right that that has to be, that has to be done, you know, it, it's, 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 I think of liberalism as, I think there are, in, in, the, in world history, there are two great families of political theory. Uh, one of them is liberalism, and the other one I call perfectionism. It's anti-liberal, but it was here before liberalism, so it's a little misleading to just define it as anti-liberalism. But they have very different fundamental assumptions and within each group, one can be on the left and the right. One can be a perfectionist or, or anti-liberal and be a communist or a fascist, which even though communists and fascists are, are, are at each other's throats. Um, and, on, and, and within liberalism, one can be on the left or the right. Conservatives have for ages valued tradition. They think you know, the, the, if something has been a certain way for a long time, that's at least a reason to keep it that way, not maybe an, an undefeatable reason, but a reason. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that view. Sometimes, you know, change can be disruptive or doing change too fast can be disruptive. That's a certainly reasonable view. Um, people who call themselves conservative today are not conservative at all because they don't want to simply retain our existing structures. They want to absolutely destroy it and, and would prefer that it simply be left in rubble than replaced with anything. So, so language has become, has become very difficult for us to use. And so that's another reason why art might be, or, or, or artistic expression might be so helpful now, because we still seem, I think, to, to, to share an artistic language when we maybe don't even share a moral language anymore. So it's, but it's Can a really good you, point. Uh, Mark, if you have an example of uh, what kind of art do you think can help us find this common ground or what, what kind of art kind of checks those boxes? Well, uh, think of art as, as, as being an argument, right? I mean, um, mm -hmm. think of the idea that if we want to sort of communicate, we, we don't only want to communicate a message often, we want to communicate a message uh, that people should have a certain kind of belief or change their beliefs in certain ways. And, and so we can do that in all sorts of various ways. We make an argument, but there are all kinds of arguments we could make, right? We can make a theological argument. We could say, <clears throat> you should think this because God says so. That's a theological argument. Um, we can make a moral argument, which says, <clears throat> excuse me, we should do this because it offends our moral principle of equality. Um, <clears throat> and that's an argument you could make to another liberal, but if you reject the principle of equality, then that's not an argument that's going to have any purchase on anybody. And we can also make aesthetic arguments, which I think work in a much, much more difficult to describe way. They influence our attitudes in ways that are sometimes really hard to pin down. Uh, because the language to use is often not so specific, but that's what makes them effective. I mean, one example, I suppose, in the United States is um, um, the HBO series on The Watchmen, um, which brought the 1921 Tulsa massacre in which uh, a, a middle-class Black community was, was killed and destroyed 
by um, uh, local uh, um, members of the Ku Klux Klan um, to everyone's attention. I mean, I don't, you know, a, lot, a huge proportion of the United States wasn't even aware of that. And I think just bringing that to people's attention in a way that was engaging made people think about racism in ways they probably hadn't before. So, so the ideas there are packaged in an artistic way in the sense that that makes them engaging and interesting. <clears throat> and, and, and that's what sort of gives us a way in when if we simply started with a moral argument, people would, as Jen, Jen mentioned, just turn off. Um, so that's one example. Uh, I, can I could think of another one. It's not necessarily, um, you know, an artist making an artwork that shows it's it's using art in a way to engage people to resolve conflicts. I took peace and conflict studies for a brief moment, which I think is very useful at, the, <laughs> at this time. And uh, for some con reconcili reconciliation efforts, they were using, I, I forgot where it was exactly. Um, maybe I could follow up or if somebody in the audience might know, but they were using theater as a way to bring two groups that were in great conflict for a long time. I don't remember if it was a prolonged or protected um, circumstance, but they used theater in possibly one way to show each other like how their, what their experience was. And I was studying this and thinking of how can we use art in other ways to, to overcome issues such as that. And one could also be like, can you imagine how you can reconcile? Or can you envision a world that you wanna live in together and have the conversation around this fictional um, story rather than feeling threatened in real life before it actually has to come to be, or you know, you get blocked. But I think, uh, yeah, looking at peace and conflict studies and seeing how art has been used, interesting and similar to the Watchmen, I guess, in terms of visiting the past and retelling it in a way that can be engaging. Yeah, I, I, I want to push back <laughs> on, okay. on top of these points. Uh, it's a it's a worry. I actually. I saw only a few episodes of Watchmen because it's a little <laughs> too heavy for me. I get nightmares if I uh, watch that stuff before going to bed. But uh, but I, I as I was watching it, I was asking myself precisely this. I was like, would a person on the right watching this shut this off and deem it to be propaganda, like lefty propaganda? And I, at, at a certain point, I, I think I ended up being convinced that yes, that I, I thought that a, that a person on the right would uh, think, oh, this is, you know, lefty BS. And it, it's, it's really complicated. Like, how do you find that place? And even, you know, theater and putting yourself in, in someone else's experience is extremely powerful. And I definitely agree with that. But at the same time, I think that mm, I think that these kinds of the people who would be most open to these kinds of exercises are tend to be the ones who need them less. Uh, may, maybe I'm may, making a very strong statement, uh, but I, I like I don't see. I think that sometimes people want to be closed off to the experience of the other, precisely because that, uh, like, putting that barrier is the tool that they're using in order to support their worldview. Somehow, it's it's a part of their worldview. I, I guess I'll rephrase this. It's a it's a part of their worldview that there's that there are barriers between people and that those should be respected. So it's mm -hmm. difficult. And I think I'm, I'm bringing this, these points up not to be, you know, a, a person who says, you know, none, none of this is right. I actually, I, I do agree strongly that aesthetics are extremely important and powerful. I'm, I'm still looking at um, I think I think I'm also more prone to say this now because I was just thinking about Borat, also. And I, as I was watching it, and I think you know he's brilliant, he's funny, but also 
you know, very disrespectful to people from Kazakhstan. If it was <laughs> about Brazil, I would be, yeah, I was, I was angry at it uh, because of, you know, the way that it's portraying Kazakhstan. But if it was about Brazil, I would be furious. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I mean, I understand. I think that he, he's doing important things. But at the same time, like, again, I don't think that he is impacting a piece of the, you know, Trump voters. Um, so yes, he, I wouldn't say. Sorry, I would. Uh, yeah, I would. I would agree with that. It's not. Um, it's not instilling respect and and opening up a way to come together. But and, and like everything else, every other kind of argument, arguments can be better or worse. Some can be really failures, and some can be really effective. I mean, saying we should. Um, so what I'm saying is not that uh, this is the solution. What I'm saying is given that moral argument seems to have no purchase on people who reject the underlying moral values that moral argument is based on, we need to use some other form of argument which can maybe have some purchase. And uh, that doesn't mean it will always have some purchase, and um, it, maybe it means it will only have some purchase, you know, of a very small portion of the time, but that's better than zero. And I think we've moved into a world where moral arguments um, to people who really already firmly reject liberalism, not people in the middle, they're still open to this, but people who reject it entirely is just a waste of time because there's no common moral language we can use. And, and so my point was that aesthetics provides us with some kind of common language, which as you say, can be used less or more effectively, and sometimes not effectively at all, right? We might say that Borat isn't a very effective way of presenting certain ideas, um, or it's not effective against the, the, a same range of, of people. There are all sorts of, of, of versions. Maybe, maybe another version here is, is um, is sort of, of Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream speech, right? If you listen to that speech or really any speech he made, I mean, just really, I mean, just amazing. I mean, that's an incredibly emotional, inspiring, involving, engaging speech. Now he could have simply said, um, you know, I have a PhD, I've read all the empirical studies and there's no empirical evidence that black and white people have any relevant differences, which, of course, is what he said. But if you said it like that, it's not going to have any kind of impact on people. Um, saying it like he said it, um, in other words, considering the use of rhetoric, the, the, the style, the, the use of metaphor, I mean, these are what made it effective. And so that's what I'm suggesting. I mean, we still have to have a good message and we still have to do it effectively, but I'm saying that aesthetics might provide a more fertile ground for making some progress between people who are so set in their moral values that they're totally closed off from moral argument. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you brought up that speech because I was thinking um, that one of the key components that I think is important in that uh, kind of aesthetic narrative is the component of future building. So I think that these, like we need to have active proposals and imagine and have like exercise the ability to construct and imagine different alternatives to what we have right now. And I think one of the most, um, one of the worst, uh, crisis that we're living right now among the many ones is the, is the crisis of uh, the lack of imagination where, where we think that all of the realities that we have right now are kind of set in stone and there isn't much room to kind of reinvent our institutions or to find common ground. Like we, it feels like these differences are um, so big that there's no way around them. And I think when I think about what are the most important things that we need to be like, what are the most important messages? I think that first it's like a message that a, it is possible and then show that by just portraying 
different uh, possibilities. And I, and I think, you know, just saying that I have a dream um, is, is an important thing to, to have dreams and to, to also, I think with, with work to show in, you know, with, with, practical examples how these dreams are possible and and not only dreams maybe this is yeah an opportunity for you jen to to talk about the scheme of things or or describe like what what the process looked like there as as i was participating in some of the sessions i i thought it was cool that it was like this very diverse group of people can you hear yeah yeah we can hear Can you hear Hold me, on, my, my connections. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear. Do you hear us? Um, doesn't seem so. Um, okay. There she goes. Sorry, I just dropped. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Where is it to talk about the scheme of things? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and how yeah, this so, uh, facilitates yeah. the process that Paula was describing. Yeah, back in, I think I wrote the proposal in 2017, just a couple of years ago. And it was basically, we have a failure, or do we have a failure of imagination? And I started making this project called The Scheme of Things that Neon introduced um, in my bio. And at first I was thinking, oh, okay, I'll present some ideas or some stories and get glimpses into this world that I'm thinking about. And it was supposed to be set in Rijeka for the capital of culture that just passed with Drugomore, and that's in Croatia. And I felt very uncomfortable about that. And I said, no, I should be inviting others to think about, you know, to imagine, to think about what world they want to live in and what city they want to live in. And so we held workshops and the question was, you know, what kind of alternative world, not a utopia, but just a preferred world to the one that we have in and think about your local environment and some things will obviously relate to on a more global level but think about the world that you want to live in and start with values identifying your values what even are they and that was one of the hardest things people had Mm. that they had to do and one you might have a lot but even if you try and identify three um, that was one of the tasks Leon took part for a bit <laughs> and, and then start thinking about features in your society or in your environment that you would like to change um, be it like the data economy or how you participate in governance or decision making um, to healthcare, housing all sorts of levels and then develop characters that live in this world that are often very kind of autobiographical in a way and around this we would have because they might make their own stories but we were basically forming one world and so there could be variations that exist in this world but you had to come together to talk about your values the things you want to see and do and you know what's motivating your your character i love that this is so interesting like multiple yeah uh, multiple realities coexisting this is fascinating. And in that process, you know, we get into the discussions that would be, imagine if you had the Democrats and Republicans doing this project, <laughs> you know, getting, getting them to talk about, well, these are my values. This is the kind of world I want to live in and <laughs> listening to each other. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that, that creating that space, Paula, you mentioned this, and to have those discussions, those you know, or conversations that, or, or arguments and disagreements that you're saying, Mark, um, I think is the hardest thing to do and bringing people to the table as well. How do we get them there? So one, one of the audience question is um, from Tom Adley, in, in what ways can high quality deliberation among randomly selected citizens help communities and societies find political common ground? And, and it just seems to me that this kind of creative, deliberative process of randomly selected people, as you just described, you, you could even like put together a group of randomly selected politicians, right? Might be a very like interesting approach to this. Like, 
because I think if you, if you just put them into a room and let them have their usual discussions that we would have on social media, just in real life, might not help as much as asking them how does the world look like that you want to live in. So, just to one of the obstacles I think um, that has to be overcome is this idea of how we get to the future, and and so among the illiberal right, and this goes back centuries through history, there's a view of history that, uh, that goes like this, that history is cyclical, that it starts at its apex and then gradually decays. And so the longer it's been around, the more decayed it is. And the only way to start a new cycle is to destroy everything, to level the ground. And that sort of automatically starts the new cycle and we start the new cycle at an apex. And so if one was to believe that, one might believe that I don't have to have any ideas about the future. I don't have to have a vision of the future. The future will just miraculously pop into existence and it will be wonderful as long as we destroy the present. Um, and a lot of very sophisticated philosophers on the right take this view. Um, this view has a secular version and a religious version. So both religious people and non-religious people think this. And, and it is a popular view on the right. And for those people, it's hard to get them to think about the future because if they're committed to that idea, they think the future just establishes itself and it's only established once we destroy the present. And so, and so that's hard. So I, think, so I think this idea of getting people together is great. Uh, and I think it will work for people who have, haven't already committed themselves to that particular idea. But it still leaves us with the problem of what to do with people who go around saying, you know, I'd rather live amongst the smoke and the rubble than live in a liberal society. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why it's important to ask them what they yeah. want the future to be I guess yeah. I think also maybe if we didn't make it so grand maybe if it doesn't have to be like what is the future but maybe if we feel like we can think about a different tomorrow or a different you know uh, something little uh, yeah. and achievable I think that, that that experience is uh, something that would be helpful for us as citizens. And I hope that governments start to see that this is one of their fundamental roles. It's, it's to understand and kind of co-create uh, mm -hmm. with citizens uh, how, how their governments are going to be. Yeah, and especially yeah. because a lot of the people in government or decision makers, they might not know about things like um, democracy earth or quadratic voting, or they might not know about these tools that are available and these new methods until we show them this is an example or a scenario of how it could be, what it could be like. How it could yeah. be used. I mean, Taiwan is an example, a living example. Yeah, Henry Lai um, asked, what are some technological ways that we can elevate uh, trust and transparency in online political conversations? And maybe that like connecting to what we just talked about, Paula, if you, if you would like to speak to Polis a bit, cause I think that would be a great way to kind of gather this idea of being a government about, you know, ideas that people in your country have and, and listening. <laughs> Sure. Um, well, this is really interesting. It's one of my uh, favorite technologies for deliberation uh, out there. And the main, uh, the aspect that everyone talks about when they're describing polis is that it basically it's a tool where there's a question, a theme, and, and citizens can come and can post a proposal. So I'll give an example that actually happened. They were trying to uh, regulate Uber and, and police is uh, used in, in Taiwan. So they were trying, when, when Uber came, there was you know, the, 
obvious response from uh, cab drivers. And then uh, they were trying to understand how government should regulate that. So they, they opened this debate on police and then people could start just put their opinions over there. And what the system does is that it aggregates clusters of opinions. So you will see uh, people who will feel that uh, technology is important and that uh, you know the government should just authorize Uber to go on and change nothing in the way that it regulates uh, the work of cab drivers. Or there was the opinion that uh, cab drivers should have some kind of response from government and maybe even uh, Uber should be banned. So there was this, uh, there were these two polls and, and they, aggregate, they, they aggregate users in those two clusters. But the interesting thing is that by doing that and kind of clearly outlining these groups, Polis shows what are the comments that uh, people from both groups liked. So the way that it works is you, you can post something and you can like or dislike. So the comments that were liked by people from both groups then were taken as points of consensus and then were transformed in legislation. In that case, it was um, that this was a really great opportunity for government to actually regulate uh, the work of, of drivers in a way that helps them also improve their services. So, and this was liked by people from both sides of the discussion. So this, this is an interesting example because it could be seen as one between the right and the left, but the consensus point seems like common sense. And I think most of the time there, there are these points that we can come together and agree with. And if we have better technologies that can help shape these discussions in a way that facilitate this consensus forming, this would be phenomenal. Unfortunately, it's exactly the opposite of what a social media does. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the interesting thing about, uh, about police also is that you cannot reply to comments. And I think that's really meaningful. You can only post something or you can like or dislike, you can never reply. So I think that it also makes uh, uh, the conversation very much future building, as I was saying, where you can only propose things and you know, signal your preference, but you can't go into you know, a, a dead end argument uh, as we often do in social media. So that, that's a, an interesting thing. And I think that there are, Police is one of them. Quadratic voting is also phenomenal and I uh, can talk about it. But I think that the main thing that they are all pointing to is that technologies can really help. And there's a, a general, I, I feel that, I, I don't know if mm. uh, you would agree with it, but I feel like there's a general kind of distrust of technology especially because we have seen, you know, with surveillance capitalism, we now don't, do not trust uh, technology organizations. Big tech have, have become the new big villains. Um, but also I think that some governments are, are fairly technophobic. It's difficult mm. to talk about the use of technology. And it's difficult also, I think, for governments to understand how, how they can implement this in a way that doesn't go chaotic, that isn't, that doesn't become like ruled by the mob. Um, but what is important, I think, is to understand that technology is just a component. It's not like technology is going to determine there's enormous room for actually, and it's extremely necessary to have the human input. So for example, in, in this, in police, I think that they had a, a policy, if I'm not mistaken, that every time that you, um, that you could not transform a consensus point into legislation. You would have uh, debates around it. They would be broadcast on television and then the government would provide a point by point explanation of why this is not feasible. You would involve experts in the process. So it's, a, it's much more about creating a process that has lots of human input mm. than kind of automating something and just being uh, ruled by by the bomb. 
I'm, I'm also mentioning this because of, of what you brought up, uh, Mark, with like how, how actually, you know, if you think about it, you know, why, why, what is the difference between open government and what Trump does, where he's like creating policies by people's requests on, on Twitter. But I think that there's much, much more to that, uh, to that discussion than, than social media. And, and we need to also mm. imagine uh, new, new possibilities there. Yeah, this was an amazing Another... story. Jen, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I just wanted to mention one point on um, the transparency question is that, well, going back to Taiwan as an example, the digital minister, who's also a board member of Radical Exchange, she, Audrey Tang, she records every, everything is transparent, um, all conversations and what they do. And that's one way people might say, well, no, something should be censored or should allow censorship, which Mark, I'd be curious about your thoughts on that. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's definitely providing transparency in a successful yeah. way. Well, just to add to that, I think what she reports, basically as a, as a minister, all of her conversations are transcribed and then published mm -hmm. online. Yeah. And she said that mm -hmm. this has helped her and all of her email exchanges as well are, are published. Yeah. So she said that it has helped her um, because people wouldn't seek her uh, time for to talk about personal interests. They would be very careful about only talking about you know, public uh things, public matters, which I think is very helpful because it, there's this myth that if you go into politics, then you will be corrupted. There's no way around it. But I think that she kind of, just by doing that, she created a protection around herself where people can't even get to the point where they try to, uh, would try to corrupt her, or would try to do something that is inappropriate. So yeah, but I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. Um, I, I think this um, narrative that, that you brought up, Paula, that governments should be open to the use of like new social technologies and information technologies like polis or, or quadratic voting is relating to a question that Matt Pruitt, uh, the president of Radical Exchange Foundation, posted, which is that the core of liberalism with equality is states neutrality between different notions of the good life. And that this that he thinks that this idea is still uncontroversial. But but he asks how, how we can revive it, like that idea that that um, yeah, the liberalism is just states neutrality, and like incorporating equality between the members of the state. Um, and, and I think that like these kind of updates to the building blocks of the state might, might revive that spirit. I don't know if one of your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, I, I, I do. So I, I think that's not quite the expression of what neutrality means that, that I think liberalism incorporates. Uh, liberalism endorses the idea that the state, the state, should be neutral between reasonable competing conceptions of the good. And so there are lots of limits built in there. First of all, neutrality within liberalism is a principle about what the state should do, not about what we should do as non-state actors. And I think, again, some liberals take it as a principle that should be that should go all the way down the line. And, and that's a mistake because it stops them from defending liberalism because they think that's being not neutral. Um, and, and, and I don't think that's correct. And also the, the neutrality is, is between reasonable comprehensive conceptions of the good, not all conceptions of the good. Um, and, and, um, and I think that's an important limit. Now, um, when liberalism was the opposition and was rising, um, the focus was on removing state oppression of, of what were in fact reasonable comprehensive conceptions of the good. But now that liberalism has, has become sort of a more dominant form of political organization, 
I think liberals become reluctant to um, to be not neutral against unreasonable conceptions. And I, I think that's a mistake. Nothing in liberalism requires us to say or not express a view on say fascism or racism or other things that are um, you know, so, so pointedly opposed to the things that liberals believe. And, and this is one of the criticisms that, um, that illiberals make about liberal, li liberalism. They claim liberals are unwilling to stand up for what they believe. And you know, like all criticisms, there's a kernel of truth in there. I think we, we, we're self-defeating when we censor ourselves and think that toleration and neutrality means we can't ever express an opinion about anything. And I think that's a mistake. So, so I would sort of, I, I, I think what one of the things we need to do is recognize that the liberal concepts of neutrality and toleration were never meant to be unlimited. And we need to do a better job of describing where those liberals, those limits are and enforcing them because some things are simply beyond those limits. Um, and it's not okay to allow people who have these bizarre views to, um, to have an audience of the world. You know, there's this, this famous American saying is you, you, you can't falsely shout fire in a crowded theater and cause a panic. Um, but because of technology, we are now all in the same theater and, and therefore anybody can falsely shout fire in the theater and cause a panic. And, and, and um, technology has made that possible. It can also do something about that. And I think it should do something about that. And I think we should, um, we should be a little less afraid of trying to do something about that than we appear to be at the mm. moment. And really like, sort of playing the devil's advocate to what you just said is that if if we want to identify this these boundaries um and at the same time like having a neutral state how, how would we go about that i'm i mean today i think these boundaries like the constitution tries to like protect these extreme cases from saying things and doing things right but but somebody has to write the constitution in a way that that prevents people from saying certain things or well the constitution has general principles in it and and then, and then we sort of give them more definition in real mm. life and and so you're right in the sense that it's very hard to make very clear definite lines uh and explain where they are um, but uh, again, if we're talking about liberal society, liberals believe in pluralism. So there are a great many views and claims within this reasonable view. Um, mm. But there are some things on the ends um, and, and these can be very destructive. Um, things that are based on patently false factual claims, for example, shouldn't be permitted. Um, yeah. it, it's it, it, saying that co coronavirus is a hoax is causing a lot of damage and saying that it doesn't exist is causing a lot of damage. Um, and, and so I think we are, remember, we're talking about only the extremes here. And, and so, although it is hard to sort of write a rule that tells you in every case where it is, mm. my sort of view is if you think it's on the borderline, you err by saying it's okay. But that doesn't mean there aren't things that are well beyond the borderline and that we should um, not, that, that are in fact falsely shouting fire and that we should not allow those kinds of shouts to, to take place. Because remember the alternative is saying everything is permitted. And although that's judgment proof, in other words, if that's the rule, then you don't have to have someone doing any enforcement or line drawing you know, the, the world unfortunately doesn't work that way. Human judgment is required and human judgment can be bad. And throughout mm. history has often been bad. But the solution I think is not to remove the need for human judgment because that's also bad. Um, and um, what, will what, what that will result in, I'm afraid, 
is an even less pluralistic society because the people who have these extreme views don't don't want don't don't think that reasonable sphere includes much at all. They think it includes very just one thing. And so that'll end up being worse. Although errors are possible, certainly. You're right about that. I just think that's I, that's life. I I agree with a lot in there. I think that you know of course the question is um, who is who is going who is deciding where where the line is, but mm. I, I do agree that technology can help us kind of mitigate uh, false information and that right now we're kind of at the very early stages of the internet and it's currently this wild west where everything is permitted and this has had a huge impact in our societies it's undeniable and and a lot of malicious actors have you know they have uh, taken advantage of the fact that there's no regulation at all and i think that one of the things I, I definitely feel hesitant at uh, the idea of governmental regulation for, you know, I think it's it's a discussion that, uh, an entirely different discussion, but uh, one that I, that we could go into. But I think what, what is what is most promising for me is the idea of encryption and the idea that you can kind of cryptographically sign all of your content online and that you, and having that as, as a tool that is available for everyone. And this, I think, would make a difference because um, you wouldn't have so many, because right now we're, we're about to get to a point where deep fake and other kinds of uh, technologies are going to make it possible for us to uh, make it so that anything is real. And this can be very destabilizing for society. So I think it's, fundamental for us to start to have some degrees, some limits online and to, and one of the things that I think will become necessary is for you to just cryptographically sign any content that comes from you, because it will be so easy to fake things that this will be a, a necessity uh, in the coming years. So, and I think that that can go a long, dis a long distance in like preventing or just diminishing the overwhelming number of fake news because the it's really hard to compete with an army of bots so if we start to have an internet where you know people with kind of verified claims and and attributes about them are are there then i think that this will lead to healthier um discussions and, and we actually do this now in various areas for example you can't make uh, false claims about a, a company in order to influence its securities, right? So you can't go out and say, my company is about to have a merger when it's not true. And we actually do police this stuff and we actually do largely prevent it. You also can't go out and say, here, buy my you know, wonderful magic elixir, which will cure cancer when that's not true. So we are able to police certain kinds of statements in certain fields. And it strikes me as kind of odd to say you can't make false claims about you know, drugs or dessert toppings, but you can make false claims about what's going on in society, about racial relations and about immigrants. And well, why should those things, which are far more important, be immune uh, from the prohibition about, uh, of making blatantly false statements? And so I think we, we can do these things. I don't know how the SEC polices statements about stock. Uh, I don't know whether they use some sort of computer al algorithm to do it, but they somehow do do it. Um, mm -hmm. And so it seems like it is possible for technology to broaden the subject matter. And instead of just talking about stock or drug effectiveness, which we do a pol police, you know, talk about certain very uh, controversial issues of the day. Um, I think it, you know, it's 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 a very much delicate question uh, because how like defining uh, what is true uh, in in the political sphere uh, might be different or a lot more challenging than defining what is true scientifically or uh, financially, 
but so so I think that you know it is it is challenging, but just the ability to create false content and false identities online from coming from false identities, because oftentimes when these, you know, the agencies who are producing false content, they utilize false uh, avatars to, to convey that, that, then that's something that can be uh, done. And of course, you don't want to, uh, it's important to have anonymity online, to have the ability to have anonymity. This is important for uh, many different reasons and pseudonymity as well, but um, if we are able to have kind of like checks uh, that can contribute to the uh, trust that you can have in any kind of profile or media, then that those markers, uh, I think, will help us navigate the online environment a lot more. And these can be cryptographic signatures, they can be, you know, they're all, all kinds of things that you, that you can do to kind of put markers on different kinds of content, which I think is different from banning um, content, uh, but it's, it's putting just more levels of accountability online, if that makes sense. Totally. Um, I, I was just thinking that we could also use that like sort of uh, limiting uh, unreasonable uh, ways for like things that people can say to, to talk about quadratic voting because I think with traditional voting methods it will be very difficult to collectively make uh, you know these fine lines which I think have to be fine when when you want to limit speech in a way like that and, and determine like you can say this or that about your stock, right? Uh, being like a representative of the company. So I, I wonder if Paula, if you could introduce quadratic voting quickly and and then we could sort of think about how, how this might help uh, navigate like many opinions to to conclusions about these things. Sure. Um... So quadratic voting is, is this voting mechanism that was created as an improvement of one person, one vote, uh, where basically you have a few options and you can cast one vote to uh, choose among uh, one of those options. And quadratic voting instead gives you a, a certain number of credits and then you can distribute your, your credits among the options so you're kind of expressing more nuance in your preference and then what it does on top of that is that it sharpens your expression of preference by uh, making it so that for every additional vote that you cast on one option you have to pay quadratically for it in credits. So one vote costs one credit, two cost four credits, three cost nine, and so forth. So what it does is that it makes very strong expressions um, very expensive. So in that sense, it's uh, taxing the, the user for very, very strong preferences. And I think that it, it also helps us um, just express ourselves more richly because you can distribute those preferences and in that calculation that you have to do when you're thinking, when, when it's really expensive to express a, a strong preference, you think about it more uh, while you're allocating. And it's something that actually you do it quite fast, but it, it's like an aid to help your prioritization. It's an aid to help you think how important things are. And after you distribute it, when you do it, you come out with, a sense that you have really expressed yourself very accurately. So that was at least in, in my experience and there's actually, there's research that shows uh, that a lot of people who use quadratic voting get that sense of expressing themselves. And it's interesting because it helps with the tyranny of the majority, which we have in one person one vote systems where the majority always wins whereas in quadratic voting 
um, a very motivated minority can organize and uh, really impact an issue because if it helps um, really give a very accurate picture of whether the strong preferences of a minority are more uh, are stronger than the small or vague preferences of the majority. So just to make this more concrete, so one person, uh, one person putting one uh, vote on something or one person putting uh, three votes on something is going to cost them nine votes, but three people putting one vote will cost them in total in aggregate three votes. So it's cheaper for a, a collective group of people to really aggregate their resources and have an impact on an issue. So this is really trying to uh, create means for different groups in a society to find consensus. It's difficult to explain, I'm sweating here. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think that it's it's one of the mechanisms, and there are, there are many different ones like police as well, and many different others. And it's important to look at those solutions also to know that the ways that there are ways also around like strict regulation, uh, and that we can also be more creative when thinking about how to use technology to uh, get better outcomes um, and it's not that technology is going to like define the results i don't want to sound like a technology determinist uh here but i think that they can help uh sh shape or guide guide us through uh processes that help us express ourselves better so it's not about uh shaping how we're going to behave but allowing us to express ourselves more richly. Thank you so much, Paula, for this great intro to critic voting. Um, okay. I, I wanted, <laughs> um, Mark, I would be interested, do you think, like, cause I think I, I feel like illiberalism is usually this in-group, out-group kind of thinking, right? That, that you have this homogeneous in-group that doesn't tolerate certain people um and and do you like do you think quadratic voting is like a good like might do a big deal to this problem and and help uh, solve it or well whenever um i, I hear discussions of this uh, i'm sort of reminded about discussions of utilitarianism which was a a, a a moral theory that for a long time was very popular. And this was the idea that what's right to do is, is what's in the common good and how do you decide what's in the common good. And, 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 and the idea here was that originally the utilitarians claim that they're very equality oriented. Everybody gets a, an equal vote essentially in deciding what the common good is and therefore utilitarianism is is admirable in that sense, but the, the the point that Paula was making and and that a lot of critics of utilitarianism made is that, well, deciding what we really want to do when deciding what people want is not simply give an up or down one vote thing is to is to consider the extent of their preferences, because if someone has a very very strong preference say against something and and three other people have a very, very mild preference for it, but you know they're almost mm -hmm. okay with the alternative, then we should do the alternative. That seems to be more you know, incorporating with things. And so in that sense, utilitarianism is defective. And so what provided voting I think does is it cures that problem that people have, uh, mm -hmm. that argument against utilitarianism that has been around for a hundred years. And that's really important because it makes utilitarianism uh, as a logistical matter, uh, something we can actually, um, you know, use as a guiding principle. The, the, the worry I have, it's not really a worry, it's a, well, so the idea of quadratic voting, I think, allows us to determine what people want in a way that seems to accord with our moral intuitions in, in that really is what people want, considering considering the strength of preferences, which counts. Mm. 
Um, and so I think it does a great job of that. Now, but there's two parts here. We, we, technology may then help us determine what people want, but what people want is also determined by the culture around them, the arguments they hear, the facts they're presented no. with, all these other things. And so we want technology to help us there so that what people want is determined not by false information, but by information that is at least debatably true. It doesn't have to be you know, many, mo most kinds of information aren't, you know, absolutely 100% true. There's always some question. That's fine. But again, <laughs> there are some kinds of information that, as I said, are beyond the pale. And so we have to, we have to, I think, figure out a way that of technology helping us filter that out. And one step further is maybe help us filter out claims about that aren't factual based that, you know, there, I mean, there are some people that just think that, uh, you know, racism is good as just kind of a starting position. And I just wonder whether those kinds of claims deserve the same treatment about claims about whether we should regulate Uber in one way or a different way. I mean, mm. they, seem, they seem different in kind, and I'm not sure that the kind of solution to the Uber question scales mm. up when we talk about that kind of problem, but I'm not sure it doesn't either. I mean, I think it's something that we should talk about and think about how technology can help us there. Um, right. so, I, so I do think quadratic voting is a real leap forward in the sense of fixing a problem with utilitarianism. Uh, and that was a very devastating problem and now it you know, mm. might not be, but it, it, it still, it doesn't, it's not, it's not the solution to everything. There are other aspects of the problem that we, we need to focus on too, which of course people who, uh, advocate quadratic voting recognize as well. That's not news to, to anyone, I'm sure. Cool. Jenny wanted to. Yeah, well, one thing um, that we're not going to have time to touch on, but that <laughs> I just want to mention is uh, behind these technological, I don't want to say solutions, but ways that we could use technology to help us with these problems. Um, are looking at the things happening kind of behind the scenes that are not about, you know, operational technologies, but more technology as a language. So either what's written in law and how companies structure their business models and in, in um, campaign finance, campaign finance um, or government funding, uh, pol political funding campaigns and the like, um, these are, and these are things that stand behind a lot of the problems. And while we would use technology can help and technologists can help, and there are very worthwhile technical solutions that there's, I think another thing that we can do is again, going back to the language question is use different mm. language and instead say it's industry that there might be the problem. It might not be the technology, but the industry aspect behind it. Um, and lobbying, for example, or the business model, um, the way that corporations have been operating since they said they should do profit at, <laughs> at all costs. Um, so changing these things would also drastically change. And then we would end up using the technologies in a different way because we have a different um, agreement of what we have hopefully agreed together is what we should pursue commonly. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. I, I've been thinking a lot about it, you know, here in Brazil, it was so scary with the pandemic, obviously for everyone, but I just, I had a strong feeling that I could not trust the guidelines that were being given by my government officials. And, and me and a lot of my friends spent like five to six months inside our homes because we were so mm. distrusting of 
you know, the, the, what was being said to us. And we felt like we wanted to be on the, on the cautious side. Because I felt like in other places, there were very clear guidelines that seemed like, and, and these decisions seem to be reasonable. And, you know, for example, you can go to parks and small groups, like, but here for us, there was, it felt like there was no one in charge. And it felt like, you know, the best thing that if you could stay at home, just stay at home, that's the only guideline. Um, and I, he was so insane and so irrational because I kept thinking like in a country where people don't have access to sanitation, they don't have access to water often. And this is something that is uh, an ongoing problem. And, and we have a pandemic, then obviously it's extremely, how can you tell people to wash their hands if they don't have access to that? And it's, it becomes like the, the structural differences are so big that we are not ready to deal with a crisis like that. And the price for everyone is so big because even if you are in a situation where you have access to water and you, have, you can buy you know, alcohol gel, which was super expensive in, in the beginning of the pandemic and completely not accessible to most people, but if, even if you are in that position and you have to be locked inside your house because a lot of people were not in that position, they have to go out of their homes because there aren't, you know, there isn't also good enough digital infrastructure to provide people with services that they need uh, by the government. So it's like, it's this insane math where that just does not make sense because it's not productive for a government and for a society that is so uh, unequal, it's no mm. nobody wins. Uh, is what I'm trying to say. There's no, nobody's winning in this uh, logic mm. of extraction and abuse. And it's interesting to me because I think that then then we start to to ask ourselves, like we we start going in such crazy surreal scenarios. For example, with with big tech companies, yes, they do have this uh, business models that favor them and they're making a lot of money, but is it even the world in which the CEOs of these companies are living is profoundly affected? So does it even make sense uh, for them? And I mm. think that I hope that one of the, speaking again about narrative as we, uh, head to the end of our conversation, I hope that one of the big changes in narrative that we start to see and that I think is also compatible with, with the internet and information technology and the globalized reality in which we live now is that we are really interconnected and that all of us are important and valuable and, and fundamental and whatever. This, this was very much made clear by the pandemic. If my neighbor is not wearing a mask, then that creates a problem for me. So mm. it, was ne it was never that tangible. So I hope that in terms of narratives moving forward that we can really absorb kind of this interconnectedness and imbue our thinking and our strategies and the way we govern and the way we do business with it. It sounds very uh, utopic, but I, I think that we are going to grow more and more like we're, we're already experiencing the reality of this in a very tangible way so i hope mm. that that translates also into a new way of uh, thinking and doing things it's a great conclusion for this <laughs> panel i think um i i don't know should we jump into this last question that, that we were thinking about and and then um so, so the last question for the panelist is that if you had to like the task to design the political economic building blocks of a new society on a more or less isolated island somewhere in the ocean, um, what would be like one or two of the defining properties of political life in your version of that new from scratch society? And like let's let's just take one minute each or something and maybe <laughs> jen do you want to start or... yeah i'm just trying to decide which two 
because I have a bunch. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm assuming that it's, uh, you know, quite populated, not just like me and a few mm -hmm. other people, and that we've already been somewhere else where we've developed some differences among us in our opinions and values. Um, I would, and that we're diverse uh, in, in like, other ways as well. I think that I these are say, good assumptions um, also for the other two. Broad called <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know which one is most. I know I told you one yesterday, but I don't know if that takes priority. But I would say more um, would be treat each other as equals, and that there would be commons, and um, and that because of our differences, that we would form very broad coalitions that no one is excluded from in making decisions. Cool. So I don't so, want to take up too much time by getting into that, but I can. <laughs> so there would be no sort of one coalition in the sense of a nation state or like, and just different Well, I collectives. don't think we would. Yeah, I don't even think I'd use the language of nation state, but in the way that we come to decide things, that if a party or a group group like we kind of divided into groups in some way where we have differences ideologically maybe um mm. or morally then or just preference of like i don't want to i don't know i don't want to have a neighbor and somebody else thinks that we should live more tight-knit um and if there were enough people where it wasn't just like 10 of us deciding this amongst ourselves um but where there was some kind of representational or a democracy like in town or a situation um in terms of input more like taiwan then it wouldn't I be see. you know divided into two parties that have to fight each other to be in control that it would be maybe five parties that actually all have to come together and, you know, discuss and work things out and run um, polls and agendas and ballots on what the public wants. Cool. Um, Mark, do you want to go next? Nothing might ever get done, but that's like... <laughs> Sorry. Right. Okay. So um, I'm going to say that the defining principles are liberty and equality. Um, but what I mean by liberty is, is not sort of the popular conception of liberty, because I think a lot of too many people now, especially on the right, think that liberty and equality conflict, that equality tells us to do things that, that a belief in liberty prohibits. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think one of the things that liberty prohibits is arbitrary treatment and arbitrary treatment is being treated unequally. So I guess I think the sort of two founding principles would be liberty and equality with liberty understood as leading to exactly the same place as equality leads to. And in that society, one couldn't have people arguing for liberty against equality because they lead to the same place. That's my view. Nice. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Paula? Um, I'll just add to that because it, I saw this uh, poll that Vitalik Buterin did the other day where he was, he asked um, if, if people thought that liberty property, properly understood was at odds with democracy. <laughs> and the surprising, you know, the, the 50 something percent said that you was at odds with democracy, which was, um, mm disappointing to for me to to see thinking that most of his followers is the creator of the ethereum blockchain which was it's one of the main ones out there and i think that's kind of indicative of how the the crypto community feels about mm. things which you know you can you can you could guess that it would go like that but it was still um set for me to to watch so i i think that uh yeah, maybe I'll just echo what, what you said, uh, 
mark in the sense that we can we can have an understanding of of freedom that is uh, in line with with democracy. Thank you. Um, I think it's interesting to see just that. I would, I, allow me to say that I, I think Jen is more aesthetically engaged than Mark and Paula, that she really described interactions and like situations where you two really worked with political definitions and terms, just as an observation, but that the kind of relates. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if, if the audience wants to find out more about Paula's thinking or Mark's thinking, uh, you can go to paulabermann.com or markrife.org. And if you want to continue this discussion also with uh, Jen and me or the radical exchange community as a whole, uh, you can go to our uh, Telegram channel, which you will find in the footer of the web side of radical exchange. And sooner or later, we'll post this call uh, this panel on YouTube. Um, thank you so much, Tim in Frankfurt to Megat for facilitating this. And, and thanks Fanny and Matt for helping prepare and promote this. And thank you, most importantly, Mark, Paula, Jen. And, and, and thanks great. Leon for setting this up. This has been great. I've really enjoyed it. And, and, and all the people at Radical Exchange too for making it possible. Thank you, Mark. Yes, thank you, thank you.